internet friends, Grace here. Today we're going to talk about our favorite computer programmer turned billionaire philanthropist, Bill Gates. We know him as the Microsoft nerd who has so selflessly appointed himself in charge of the physical well-being of our future. Which has a lot of us wondering, who was Bill Gates before Microsoft? I'm just a fake silhouette, avoiding every threat. Nicknamed Trey, but formerly known as William Gates III, Bill Gates was born in 1955 in Seattle, Washington into a family of affluence and power. His father, William Gates II, measuring six feet, seven inches tall, was an attorney who co-founded Preston Gates and Ellis, a law firm that had offices across the United States and China. As a man highly involved in politics, William Gates holds quite the laundry list of accolades. As he sat on the board of eugenicist Margaret Sanger's Planned Parenthood before the era of Roe versus Wade. Not only that, but he was also the face of a state income tax initiative in Washington state. After his late wife passed, William Sr. married Mimi Gardner, longtime friend of Teresa Hines Carey. Mimi is fluent in Chinese and served as former director of Asian art at the Yale University Art Gallery. But let's get back to the late Mama Gates. Because in addition to popping out Bill Gates, she also had two daughters, Christy and Libby. And Mama Gates, who also is known as Mary Maxwell, started off as a humble school teacher and eventually became chairwoman of United Way. She came from a long line of money and power, as her father was a wealthy banker and her grandfather served as president of the National City Bank in Seattle and was the director of the Seattle branch of the Federal Reserve Bank. Side note, how come when you travel down the rabbit hole on virtually any topic, the same creatures are always festering down at the bottom? With a bloodline like this, it seems like, for Bill, the path ahead was clear. In all of his biographies, there's an emphasis on Bill's intellect that manifested early on in childhood. He was smarter than the other children. He was different. He was destined for success. Bill grew up attending the University Congregational Church which now describes itself as a progressive Protestant church committed to social justice in an institution that celebrates diversity in religious background, sexual orientation, race, and abilities. Though it seems like the impact of a Christian doctrine was lackluster in Bill's childhood. As he would later go on to say, I don't have any evidence of that when asked by a Time Magazine's reporter about the divinity of the human soul, specifically if the human soul was special. When Bill was of age, he was accepted into Seattle's most exclusive and prestigious Lakeside School, where he bragged to his teachers that he'd be a millionaire by age 30. Lakeside was able to collect enough funds through donations to purchase something only big companies could afford in the 60s, a computer. 
The story goes like this. Bill taught himself to code by reading the computer handbook, or in other words, was able to get the computer to perform tasks he wanted to execute. And he and his buddy, Paul Allen, formed a club called the Lakeside Programmers. And hold up, Paul Allen is two years older than Bill? But Paul's over here looking like he's 40 while Bill look, Bill, Bill looks like the perfect target for a game of dodgeball. Anyway, somehow the Lakeside Programmers, composed of miners, went on to make business deals with computer corporations during that time, getting paid to find bugs in the software and write computer programs. Bill is credited with making one of the first computer viruses during this time. Maybe this was where he learned that by creating the computer virus, he could profit from its removal. Bill took the SAT twice so he could get the perfect score, and he came close at 1590 out of 1600, and was eagerly accepted at Harvard, where he attended college but would never graduate, because his vision of having a personal computer on every office desk and in every home took precedence, and his company, Microsoft, took off with the help of his old high school buddy, Paul Allen. In 1980, Microsoft and IBM struck a deal, and the rest was history. Six years later, Microsoft was launched on the stock exchange, and Bill and his best buddy Paul became instant millionaires. Though before his death in 2018, Paul Allen wrote in his memoirs that Bill was a bully who tried to cut Paul's share in the company as Paul was recovering from cancer. In 1994, Bill married Melinda French, a marketing manager at Microsoft and daughter of an aerospace engineer from Dallas, Texas which really makes my Operation Paperclip senses tingle. I don't, I don't know about you. Today, Bill Gates has a net worth of $98.9 billion, is heavily involved in politics, and is known worldwide as a philanthropist, having established the Gates Foundation in 2000 with his wife, his father, and Warren Buffett. The foundation has become the largest private foundation in the world, holding around $50 billion in assets with its stated goals claiming that from poverty to health to education, the goal is to improve the quality of life for billions of people. And for decades, the Gates Foundation has given free vaccinations to people in the third world, while Bill has become more and more politically outspoken, lining the pockets of our elected officials with Federal Reserve notes. Which is really rich because Bill started a movement for billionaires to give away most of their wealth in philanthropic endeavors. Bill is one of the richest people in the world because of the wealth he gained from Microsoft stock. And the stock price appreciation is not taxable until the shares are sold. So he held on to these things for decades, which delayed paying capital gains tax. And to avoid this even further, he donated these shares to the Gates Foundation. So our benevolent and altruistic billionaire over here successfully worked the tax loophole of charitable organizations to enhance his own wealth. If what they say is true and money is power, Bill Gates is one of the most powerful people in the world. So do you think our dearest Google bots and our beloved YouTube employees are still watching or can we finally talk about what we wanna talk about without the algorithm bearing this video six feet under the search engines? Listen, I know Bill Gates' impact is an extremely divisive topic. I know some of you watching are people who work in the medical field and a lot of what Bill does and lobbies for, you see play out in your own workspace. Generally, I find that people either think Bill's whole philanthropy with the Gates Foundation is a benefit to mankind and a success story is an inspiration to many young entrepreneurs. Or people are like me and would run as fast as you could if you saw Bill or Melinda roll up to your neighborhood. For the former group, I want you to know that I was you. And I believe the same things once. Because mainstream media runs so many feel-good pieces on the foundation's work. They've successfully framed Bill Gates' life as the tale of the underdog, even though he, he came from wealth and influence. And to question any of that results in shame from the loudest of voices. So I get it. But the truth is, there's a difference between the treatment and care of someone's physical well-being in the pharmaceutical industry. Big oil has been big pharma since 1874. It all started with the Rockefellers and Standard Oil. And remember, it was Devil Bill who sired oil tycoon John D, who built Standard Oil. 
And eventually, the Rockefeller Foundation, the philanthropic organization that has shaped and funded many aspects of modern medicine. In every official Rockefeller biography, they go on record saying that Devil Bill was known as a bigamist, con artist, and most notably, a snake oil salesman. The life and charitable work of Bill Gates is nothing new. Bill Gates represents the continuum of Rockefeller medicine, or the continuum of their long-established formula of problem-reaction-solution. But exchange big oil for big tech, and now we've arrived in the present. Do you ever remember electing Bill Gates so that he could influence your daily life in the legislation of your country? Hmm, neither do I. Do you recall at any point in this video, me saying that Bill Gates attended any form of medical school or training in the medical field? Hmm, neither do I. So let me give you an interesting timeline of recent events. In 2013, Bill flew on the Lolita Express with our favorite notorious Mossad blackmailer who didn't kill himself, Jeffrey Epstein. Through this connection, Bill Gates made donations personally directed by Epstein. In 2014, a man was arrested at Bill's estate for possessing 60,000 photos of children. But apparently this dude got the DuPont Air treatment with a mere slap on the wrist, being ordered to stay away from children. In 2015, in a TED Talk, Bill demonstrated more of his Nostradamus-like ability as he did when he was a child. You remember when he told all of his teachers he'd be a millionaire by age 30? In this talk, he warned a coronavirus-like threat and predicted to the audience that he would be the savior of this future pandemic. Fast forward to 2018, when Bill ran a pandemic virus simulation which he projected would kill 33 million people if the simulation came to fruition. One year later, in October of 2019, the Gates Foundation hosted Event 201 at the World Economic Forum in New York which was a high-level pandemic exercise that played out a novel coronavirus pandemic with potentially catastrophic consequences, requiring cooperation between industries, governments, and key institutions. Johnson & Johnson was in attendance. As Event 201 was happening, the 2019 Military World Games were taking place, hosting 110 nations and thousands of military members from around the world and none other than Ground Zero, Wuhan, China. Yes, you heard that right. The World Military Games were held in Wuhan, China, ground zero of the coronavirus, mere weeks before the first case was reported. In January 2020, a federal court unsealed indictments against a Harvard professor and chemistry department head Charles Lieber, along with two Chinese nationals. Prosecutors said that one of the nationals is a Boston University researcher who was a lieutenant in the People's Liberation Army and the other was a cancer researcher who attempted to smuggle vials of biological materials in his sock. It was disclosed that Wuhan University paid Lieber $50,000 a month, and he was given over $1.5 million to establish a lab at Wuhan universities. But don't worry, Snopes told us nothing strange was going on with Lieber so we could rest easy and go back to being good little sheep. On February 28, 2020, Bill Gates called coronavirus the once-in-a-century pathogen we've all been worried about, as he sounded the alarm for world leaders to respond accordingly. A few weeks later, Bill Gates stepped down from the Microsoft Board of Directors, which he said was in an effort to dedicate more time to philanthropic priorities including global health and development. With all this newfound free time, Bill decided to do an AMA on March 18th, or in other words, a question and answer session on Reddit. In this question and answer session, Bill disclosed his goal of having digital certificates for any and all people to show who has recovered from coronavirus or been tested recently or if they've received their coronavirus vaccine. Microsoft and MIT have collaborated in developing tattoo markers to show if you've been inoculated. Bill has also been working on the ID2020 project, which is a digital ID microchip implanted under the skin that, when scanned, would show identification information. It's reported that refugee populations will be the first to receive ID2020. There's talk of implementing the system in the United States, starting with the homeless population of Austin, Texas. With all the fear surrounding this pandemic, many will not have to be forced to get something as Orwellian as a government microchip. They'll ask for it out of fear. 
their consent will be manufactured, but will yours? This is a very slippery slope to social credit scores and not being able to leave your house, unless your microchip is firmly implanted and updated. Announced on March 30th, the United States government has cut deals with Johnson & Johnson and Gates funded Moderna Incorporated to work on a coronavirus vaccine. Yes, you heard that right. The same Johnson & Johnson that is responsible for cancer-causing baby powder that they knowingly sold for decades. The same Johnson & Johnson that has been sued for billions of dollars for fueling the opioid crisis and pushed good people into an early grave. Yes, that will be our savior, making a rush an experimental vaccine hundreds of millions of people will inject into their bodies out of fear. To conclude here, I'm not making any outrageous claims or theories about Bill Gates. I've simply told you the background of one of the people who stands to benefit the most from what is happening right now. From being financially invested in the cure, to the potential of mass surveillance in an Orwellian state in the form of a microchip, in this video, I told you exactly who Bill Gates was before Microsoft, and I've told you exactly who he is after. Hey, internet friends. Remember a couple weeks ago when I made a video about our favorite billionaire philanthropist, Bill Gates? The great-grandson of the president of the National City Bank and director of the Seattle branch of the Federal Reserve. The son of William Gates, an attorney who sat on the board of Planned Parenthood before the days of Roe versus Wade. Gates Sr. rubbed shoulders with people who would go on to shape the 21st century. And it would appear that this pedigree translates to one thing. The path for Bill Gates was forged long ago. Yes, in the last video, I covered who Bill Gates was before Microsoft. And I laid out a brief but curious timeline of who he was after Microsoft in order to provide context to the current events we're seeing play out across the world's stage. This is very rare for me, but we gotta go back in. We gotta make a second video on this character because it's apparent to me that I went too easy on him. And with what's at stake here, I can't live with that. So here we go. Hold on to your butts, internet friends. It's gonna be a wild ride because today, we're gonna talk about exactly who Bill Gates was after Microsoft. I'm just a fake silhouette, avoiding every threat. Bill Gates, with a net worth of $98.9 billion, accumulated the bulk of his wealth through Microsoft stock. But he would have never amassed such a great fortune without his special relationship and contracts with the United States government as well as governments around the world. Contracts that would date back to the 1980s and are still being awarded today. Bill actually got called out on this in 1999, when a federal judge ruled that this edge had given Microsoft unparalleled dominance in the computer industry to bully rivals and squelch competition. This ruling depicted Microsoft as an unrestrained behemoth, and the Justice Department hailed the ruling as an important victory that served to illustrate that in America, no person or company is above the law. Soon after getting a reputation as the bully and the bad guy, Bill established the Gates Foundation in 2000 with his wife, father, and Warren Buffett. And eventually the Gates Foundation became the largest private foundation in the world, holding around $50 billion in assets, with its stated goals claiming that from poverty to health to education, the goal is to improve the quality of life for billions of people. And for decades, the Gates Foundation has given free vaccinations to people in third world countries. While Bill has become more and more politically outspoken, lining the pockets of our elected officials with Federal Reserve notes, and buying influence, which we'll get to in a moment. But first, let's talk about these countries the Gates Foundation has touched. We'll begin in India. Between 2000 and 2017, in an effort to eradicate polio, the Gates Foundation worked in tandem with India's National Technical Advisory Group on Immunization, which mandated doses of polio vaccines with overlapping immunization programs to children under the age of five. During this time, a non-polio acute flaccid paralysis epidemic rocked India, paralyzing 490,000 children, which Indian doctors turned around and blamed the Gates Foundation for. 
and the Indian government swiftly dialed back the immunization regimen and all financial ties between the Gates Foundation and the NTAGI were severed because of the conflicts of interest between the Gates Foundation and pharmaceutical companies. There were questions on how these conflicts of interest may have influenced India's vaccination strategy during this time. In 2010, the Program for Appropriate Technology and Health, otherwise known as PATH, which has received hundreds of millions of dollars in grants from the Gates Foundation, conducted an unlawful and unethical study on thousands of tribal girls in India, testing out two HPV vaccines. PATH's experiments were halted after seven children died. Later, a government report stated that the deaths were unrelated to the HPV drugs, but the Standing Indian Parliamentary Committee maintained that the deaths were linked to the inoculations, and they pointed out that PATH conducted themselves unethically, lacking informed consent from their human guinea pigs. As many of the girls' parents were illiterate and couldn't sign their own name, so they signed their consent forms with a thumbprint. Furthermore, the adverse events as a result of these studies were not properly monitored or reported. But the data the committee collected revealed that beyond the seven girls who had died, 120 of the girls experienced adverse reactions like severe headaches and stomach aches, epileptic seizures, and many even experienced early onset menstruation. While the committee recommended legal action against PATH, the government of India decided to just issue a warning letter. PATH's response was to defend itself, saying that what they were doing was an observational study of two already approved vaccines, not a clinical trial. Thus, informed consent and in monitoring adverse reactions was unnecessary. Luckily, when I searched these incidents, the authoritative voice of Snopes appears at the top of my search engine, ready and willing to tell me how silly these claims are, and that there is no link between PATH and the Gates Foundation. Even though the Gates Foundation has documented all of their grants and the catalog is easily searchable. Well, anyway, if Snopes says it's fake news, I guess we'll all just forget about it. God bless you, Snopes. So let's move on to the Gates Foundation in Africa. In 2002, the Gates Foundation Sub-Saharan African Vaccination Campaign forcibly vaccinated thousands of children against meningitis, and of the 500 who received the shot, 50 were left paralyzed, with the title of an article boldly stating, We are guinea pigs for the drug makers. 2010 was a big year for the Gates Foundation. It was the year the Gates Foundation committed $10 billion to the World Health Organization. Keep in mind, the World Health Organization is now operated by a known terrorist. I'm not even kidding you, I, I wish I was. Tedros is a former member of the violent Ethiopian Communist Party. Anywho, Bill Gates' donation was sent off with him saying, we must make this the decade of vaccines. And indeed, he has pretty much met that goal over the last decade. Later in 2010, the Gates Foundation funded a trial of an experimental malaria vaccine, which killed 151 African children, including infants. Over 1,000 of the 6,000 individuals who underwent this malaria drug trial were left with paralysis, seizures, and convulsions. In 2014, the World Health Organization was accused of chemically sterilizing millions of Kenyan women without their consent. They did this with what was said to be a tetanus vaccine. The World Health Organization has since admitted to developing sterility and family planning vaccines for over a decade. Of course, Africa isn't the only place these forced sterilizations have reached. Beyond vaccines, they've even tried to limit fertility by genetically modifying crops, like they did with contraceptive corn. And back when Monsanto was only Monsanto, not Bayer Monsanto, Gates had invested millions and millions of dollars in the company. But back to Africa. A 2017 study showed that the DTP vaccine that the World Health Organization had issued across Africa was killing more children than the actual diseases the vaccine was supposed to prevent against. The published study showed that the DTP vaccinated girls suffered 10 times the death rate of children who had not yet received the vaccine. And you would think that in response, the World Health Organization would recall the vaccine. No, it's still in use today. So what does that tell you about their intent? Beach, 
So now we're up to speed with the needed context to properly assess the present. When we combine the aforementioned anecdotes alongside Bill Gates' opinion that the world is overpopulated, his simulations of viral outbreaks, and his predictions that he will be mankind's savior, then sandwich all of that between Gates Foundation's Event 201, which was held back in October of 2019, and was a high-level pandemic exercise that played out a novel coronavirus pandemic with potentially catastrophic consequences. We can then partner that information with the fact that the 2019 Military World Games were taking place at the exact same time, hosting 110 nations and thousands of military members from around the world, and none other than Ground Zero, Wuhan, China. The cherry on top is really the Bill Gates Reddit AMA, or the question and answer session, in which he disclosed his goal of having digital certificates for any and all people to show who has recovered from the coronavirus, or been tested recently, or if they've received their coronavirus vaccine. All of this seems to be a move towards ID2020, which is a global digital ID program that Microsoft has lended and engineered technology in pursuit of. This is all very interesting and disturbing and altogether unsurprising at this point, but what we've got here is a really curious sequence of events, which Snopes would quickly dismiss as mere conjecture or coincidence. But no one cares what Snopes thinks, even though they're promoted to the top of every Google search. They solicit prostitutes on the company clock anyway. What I care about is what you think, so what's going on here? Many of you believe that this deception needed to be put to a halt, and you took to change.org to petition to stop ID2020. But unfortunately, many of your petitions were swiftly removed. This is probably due to the fact that Bill Gates has bought influence in change.org with millions of dollars in donations. Here's what I think. Between all of the loudly voiced opinions on how overpopulated Bill thinks our world is, his vaccination programs and vested interests disguised as philanthropic efforts, his ride on Lolita Express and business dealings after Jeffrey Epstein was registered as a sex offender, the thousands of graphic child images found on Bill Gates' property during that time, and his nonstop campaign to control global health policy. I think his use of spirit cooking Marina Abramovic and Microsoft's most recent commercial is so revealing of who these people actually are. Marina Abramovic is a self-proclaimed artist who specializes in what she calls performance art that only those in high, illuminated society and politics appreciate, and everyone else recognizes her as a bargain bin Aleister Crowley doing satanic rituals. And we made our disdain for this level of taunting so perfectly clear that Microsoft was forced to take the commercial off the internet. Now, Bill Gates' social media is filled with the voices of those who have had enough from other famous folks to medical personnel to ordinary individuals. So let me leave you with this. Now it's my turn to play Nostradamus. I predict that Bill Gates will cry out in pain very soon, bouncing from CNN to LN to C-SPAN, talking about the unfair campaign against him. Remember, his great-granddaddy was president of the Federal Reserve Bank in Seattle, and being a professional victim is in his DNA. But no matter how many articles published by Snopes or Washington Post or how many PR segments they do on Bill Gates' character, remember that at the end of the day, we did not elect Bill Gates as president. We are not his human guinea pigs and we do not consent. Hey internet friends, in previous videos we've covered who Bill Gates was before Microsoft, who Bill Gates was after Microsoft, and what it means to give eugenics a hot rebrand as population control. But today we're going to go in a different direction because Bill Gates is just one guy. Today we're going to look at the money and power behind Bill and discuss some companies and individuals that might not be household names, but they manage the names you know in your household. So let's take a closer look at one faction of what the children these days are calling the deep state. Okay. 
The history of the most popular coffee chain in the world began in 1971 in Seattle, Washington, which originally started off as a store that exclusively sold coffee beans. A decade later, Howard Schultz was hired as the marketing and sales director, and he quickly turned the coffee bean shop into a cafe, with his strategy being aggressive expansion as the years went on. But in the 1980s, Starbucks had gotten into financial trouble because the original founders had acquired a company called Pete's Coffee. The owner of Starbucks approached Schultz, relaying his intention to keep Pete's. Schultz was then offered ownership of Starbucks for $3.8 million if he could come up with the funds from private investors within 60 days. Schultz claimed that he had no money and by the end of the month, he'd barely raised half only to have the same Starbucks owner approach him saying that he'd received an unsolicited offer on the table for $4 million from a Titan investor. And if Schultz couldn't raise the money by the end of the month, he'd have to accept the offer. In Schultz's retelling of this story, he relayed these events to his attorney friend. And his attorney friend responded by telling Schultz to come into the office and speak with the senior partner at the firm, who just so happened to be William Gates Sr the father of Microsoft's Bill Gates. You know, Gates Sr., the attorney who sat on the board of Planned Parenthood before the days of Roe versus Wade. Gates Sr., who married Mary Maxwell, the banker's daughter and the granddaughter of the president of Seattle's Federal Reserve Bank. Yeah, Gates Sr. is standing proud at six feet, seven inches tall. We're all familiar by this point. So Gates Sr. caught wind of this transaction and advised Schultz to take a walk with him and they walked down to the unnamed rival buyer's office where Gates Sr. gave the investor a verbal lashing, saying, you should be ashamed of yourself, stand down. This Schultz kid is gonna realize his dream. And then Gates turned to Schultz and instructed him to buy Starbucks. And not to worry, he and Bill Gates Jr. were gonna help him. What a beautiful story, right? It's got everything you could possibly want piping hot coffee, the rise of the underdog, and of course, a wise older gentleman looking out for the dreams of a young man. Yeah, sure, it's the same fella who championed the early extermination of many potential dreams through Planned Parenthood, but we won't dwell on that because Gates Sr. made this one American dream come to fruition. Such inspiration. Truly achievable to anyone willing to put in the hard work. And of course, willing to accept a sweetheart deal and work around the quiet shadow ownership of a company. If there is anything Starbucks has been successful at, it's cornering a demographic by selling the cafe experience with the Starbucks cup as a status symbol. With the actual Starbucks logo being what most people think is a twin-tailed mermaid that Starbucks refers to as a siren, but it's actually a hybrid creature, her upper half being a human female and lower half being two fishtails or two serpent tails. The coffee in that cup comes at an objectively high price. And one might assume that high prices equate to high quality or at least real ingredients. But when you break down the composition of Starbucks drinks and baked offerings, what you're left with is GMOs, pesticides, high fructose corn syrup, and traces of growth hormones throughout. All of which are linked to chronic disease and fertility issues. Even the milk is GMO from cows that are fed a diet of GMO corn. And that corn is sprayed with pesticides like Monsanto's Roundup. If you've ever sprayed Roundup in your yard, you know from experience that it kills everything it comes into contact with. So what does it mean to ingest it on the daily? So Starbucks priority should be to get away from the GMO Monsanto ingredients, right? Well, let's follow the money and demonstrate why they can't. The breakdown of Starbucks ingredients might just be an accent point on the story, but it's actually a really big deal. Since we can draw a distinct line between the Schultz Gate Starbucks sweetheart deal and the company that controls a majority of the world's food supply. Monsanto originally began as a chemical company, eventually evolving into a pharmaceutical company, then partnered with the military to give us Agent Orange the insecticide DDT, PCBs, and artificial growth hormones, which have done nothing but leave a trail of destruction in their wake. Monsanto has had to pay out millions upon millions of dollars to settle lawsuits because of the harmful effects of their chemicals. 
So they eventually shifted their focus to agriculture, and guess what? Now they control our food supply and they were able to stay true to their roots by introducing chemicals and genetic modification to crops. If we follow the trail of money from the origin of Starbucks, the breakdown of Starbucks ingredients leading us to Monsanto, we arrive at 2009, when the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation purchased 500,000 Monsanto shares, or at least that's what was published and documented in that fiscal year. In other words, that's an investment we know about. Bill simultaneously bought a huge amount of shares in Cargill, a faceless agri-giant that rules over the world's food commodities. And by doing this, he effectively has a huge financial stake in the world's food supply. And that supply is controlled by companies with less than pristine reputations. And that's putting it lightly. Later, Bill Gates invested millions and millions of dollars in plant-based meat alternative companies like Beyond Meat, in the Impossible Burger, sold across upscale restaurants, supermarkets, and even fast food places like Burger King, Carl's Jr., and now Starbucks. The CEO of Impossible Foods is Patrick Brown, a Stanford biochemistry professor specializing in DNA research, whose father worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. While marketing professionals will engineer campaigns to paint these plant-based meats as healthy alternatives, it's proven and documented that these burgers use GMO soy and vegetable sprays with Monsanto Roundup. Recently, Monsanto was acquired by Bayer for $66 billion. Bayer is a German pharmaceutical company that was part of the IG Farben conglomerate back in the Third Reich and was convicted by the American military of taking advantage of the absence of legal and ethical constraints on medical experimentation to test its drugs on unwilling human subjects during World War II. You'd think that Bayer would have learned their lesson and maybe tried to behave, I don't know, a little more ethically over the decades, but no. They have just as many scandals and lawsuits as Monsanto, like recently. When Bayer Laboratories realized their blood products were contaminated with HIV and decided that their financial investment in these products was too high to toss out all their vials of blood in a fiery dumpster. So they sold their HIV tainted products to South America and Asia without the courtesy of a warning. Yes, this is the company that controls our pharmaceuticals and food supply. Aren't we all thrilled? No wonder Bill Gates is making it rain on these companies. They're literally the MVPs of his and his family's passion. Population control. Back in the 80s, Bill Gates Sr., an attorney who sat on the board of Planned Parenthood before anyone even knew what Planned Parenthood was, and his son, the Microsoft co-founder and great-grandson of the Federal Reserve, played a key role in Howard Schultz's Starbucks empire. In the early 2000s, after a stint of bad publicity within the media for his legal trouble, Bill Gates established the Gates Foundation for his philanthropic endeavors and has since killed a number of children and adults in India and Africa, leaving many paralyzed with his experimental pharmaceutical trials and vaccinations. During this time, not only has Bill Gates stated an explicit interest in population control, but he's also invested in pharmaceutical and agricultural giants like Monsanto, who have a notorious reputation for the outright disregard of human life. Not only that, but meaningful amounts of Monsanto chemicals can be found in Bill Gates' investments like Starbucks drinks and baked goods, Beyond Meat products, and Impossible Foods burgers. These chemicals have been proven to cause cancer and infertility. Sounds like some master plan laid out by one of the world's greatest boogeymen. But Bill Gates is just one guy. Who is really the driving force behind him? Who is the real financial powerhouse behind all of these companies? Who is the man behind the curtain? Well, I won't keep you waiting. If you follow the money, you arrive at one place. Bain & Company. Bain & Company was founded in 1973 by former bigwigs at the Boston Consulting Group. And those bigwigs and their families now own sports teams like the Boston Celtics, 
New England Patriots, and the Boston Red Sox. Multi-billionaires who sit on the board of the Federal Reserve. Bain & Company is one of the big three elite management consulting firms who has been notoriously secretive about itself and its work for clients, earning it the title of the KGB of consulting over the years. You might have heard of Bain & Company during Mitt Romney's run for presidency. The two most famous people out of Bain are Dick Cheney and Mitt Romney. Of course, Dick Cheney was vice president under the Bush administration, and Mitt Romney almost became president. Mitt Romney himself started off at Boston Consulting Group, where he worked alongside none other than Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Eventually, Mitt Romney went on to work for Bain, where he quickly rose up the ranks, becoming one of the company's vice presidents by the late 70s heading Bain's venture capital arm called Bain Capital. You might not ever guess this, but the wholesome Mormon Mitt Romney was there through it all, quite literally shaping the culture and realities of the United States and countries around the world through Bain Company. While Bain functions as a private equity firm, I think we can quite confidently say that Bain Company is a US intelligence front and military industrial company, since some of the most famous people out of Bain are high-level government officials. And Bain's most famous clients were, and are, Halliburton, Raytheon, Monsanto, Microsoft, Starbucks, and even the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Bain manages a great portion of the Fortune 500 companies. That's why their stocks do so well. And while Bain says they're a consulting firm, their pattern is one of a buyout firm that comes in, takes over and quietly leaves the shell intact while they place their own people in positions of power within a company. You might be surprised to hear that Bain manages Ryan Seacrest, the guy who is responsible for the reality TV show Keeping Up with the Kardashians. And we can effectively say that the wholesome Mormon Mitt Romney was the guy who put the transsexual agenda on television through the Bruce Caitlyn Jenner saga. So when Kanye West gets mouthy and is hauled off on a stretcher and put in timeout for a few days, only to return looking like a Marshall Mathers wannabe clone, that's all Bain Company. When you see Bill Gates doing an ask me anything question and answer session on Reddit or posted up on the six o'clock news, labeled as a pandemic expert and talking about mandatory vaccinations, keeping everyone inside for the foreseeable future and grinning with glee, that's Bain Company. When you're nibbling on your plant-based name brand fast food burger and get a mouthful of delicious Monsanto Roundup, that's Bain Company. When you take a swig of your mocha frappe latte only to get inundated with a myriad of social agendas flying out of Starbucks headquarters, you guessed it, that's Bain Company. And if you're already a liberal anyway and you enjoy such agendas in a piping hot cup of coffee from Starbucks, Remember, your worldview is being socially engineered by the work of Republican candidate for president, wholesome Mormon governor and sitting senator Mitt Romney, and a bunch of crusty old fellas who've been with Bush Sr. since the days of Skull and Bones. So we followed the money, but where did we arrive? Well, in this video, we arrived at one tiny centralized little group, all owned and operated either by Skull and Bones CIA financial investment and management arm, otherwise known as Bain, or it's owned and operated by Mossad, Carlyle, or BlackRock. This group has unlimited money and power to take over companies and industries they deem crucial. And these folks have unlimited money because they're literally sitting on the board of the Federal Reserve. Which brings us to Bill Gates' family legacy, eugenics. Now rebranded as population control with Planned Parenthood on his father's side and the Federal Reserve Bank on the other. Everything Bill Gates has ever touched, from Microsoft to Starbucks to Bayer Monsanto, vaccine makers and plant-based burgers, it was all managed by Bain and Company. They're the ones who put Microsoft computers at every desk in every office, in every government building, in the computer lab of every school. And these computers and programs have the backdoor access for spying. This is your deep state, or at least a faction of it. Hey internet friends, for years we've examined the daily activities of swamp creatures. We've covered the hierarchy of the criminal elite. We've debated over the origins of the global establishment. But it's time we discuss how exactly we can go about dismantling the deep state. 
I propose we take a little inspiration from Sun Tzu and forget strength against strength, but rather strike where the enemy is weak. That's why we're gonna dive right into the sordid network of the criminal cartel and their connections, bridging their shadowy past to the ever-evolving present. By chopping away at the roots of the poison tree, focusing on one unsuspecting individual who spent decades constructing his squeaky clean persona. Today, we're aiming straight for the Achilles heel of the deep state, Mitt Romney. No, you haven't been teleported back to the 2012 election. I'm seriously dragging Mitt Romney back from whatever pit he's been festering in ever since his loss. And trust me, it won't take long to see why. Mitt Romney was born into one of the most distinguished Mormon families, a family who was intertwined with politics long before Romney ever made his presidential bid. His father served as the governor of Michigan and was in President Nixon's cabinet. Needless to say, his family was on top. As a freshman at Stanford University, Romney's classmates reported witnessing him dressing up as a police officer on more than one occasion. And Romney bragged about putting a red flashing light and siren on top of his car to pull over unsuspecting drivers. In the middle of his college studies, Romney traveled to France as a Mormon missionary, which afforded him the opportunity to totally dodge the draft for the Vietnam War. Eventually, he left Harvard Business School in the 1970s to join the Boston Consulting Group, where he worked alongside Benjamin Netanyahu, whom you might know as the Prime Minister of Israel. One of Boston Consulting Group's big clients was Monsanto, an agrochemical and agricultural biotechnology corporation that was started in 1908 by a pharmaceutical company agent who sought to produce saccharin, an artificial sweetener that was only manufactured in Germany at the time. Meanwhile, back in the US in the late 1920s, Monsanto began producing PCBs for an estimated 40 years, knowingly discharging toxic waste into a West Anniston, Alabama creek and dumping millions of pounds of PCBs into open pit landfills. The result of which was an Anniston community rife with cancer. Monsanto's chemicals were saturated in the dirt, air, food supply, and even the blood of the residents. Monsanto knew what they did, the people of Aniston knew what they did, and certainly the government was well aware too. Everybody knew these chemicals they were synthesizing would destroy God's creation, and God's creation would be replaced with Monsanto's own creation. Regardless, Monsanto was contracted by the government to produce toxic chemicals like DDT and dioxins like Agent Orange in the coming decades. Agent Orange was the most commonly used herbicidal poison that was sprayed over rural Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And since the Vietnam War, there's been an epidemic of birth defects, chronic illnesses, and fetal anomalies. Not to mention, Agent Orange was also used heavily over the perimeters of many US military bases, which resulted in Agent Orange being splashed directly upon American soldiers. And post-war class action lawsuits followed, in which Monsanto routinely denied that there was a link between their poisons and the veterans' health problems. Eventually, it was decided that a Vietnam veteran would receive a maximum of $12,000 as a settlement to spread out over the course of 10 years. And by accepting this settlement, a disabled veteran would become ineligible for many state benefits such as food stamps, public assistance, and government pensions. So much for respecting and caring for our veterans, right? These days, you know Monsanto for their lawsuits regarding the deadly effects of Roundup exposure the monopolization and genetic modification of the world's food supply, and Bill Gates' intense financial interest in the company. In the last few years, Monsanto was acquired by Bayer, who was once a part of a giant chemical cartel known as IG Farben, the second largest stockholder of Rockefeller's Standard Oil, and the single largest donor to the campaign of Adolf Hitler, despite many of the prominent scientists and figureheads of IG Farben being Jewish. Bayer used Auschwitz as a testing grounds for genetic modification, chemical experiments, pharmaceuticals, and vaccine trials on prisoners, with its most notorious practice of using Zyklon B within the camps. And after Bayer conducted these experiments, like testing out vaccines, they later collected the bodies for autopsy. Eventually, some of the IG Farben scientists were tried for their war crimes at the Nuremberg trials. After sentencing prominent scientists to incredibly short imprisonments, a good number of these German scientists were relocated from Germany to the United States in Operation Paperclip, given new identities and installed in positions of power within the United States government, heading NASA, the CIA, and biological warfare programs. 
On a related note, Standard Oil was convicted of war crimes when it was discovered that the Standard Oil president was giving free oil to Hitler. But while he was convicted, nothing really happened, and Standard Oil became bigger than ever, with Rockefeller medicine and vaccines dominating the for-profit medical playground in the United States. So we can trace Monsanto and Bayer back to World War II Germany. And it's been said that Monsanto and Bayer were always one company from the very beginning. But the $66 billion Bayer-Monsanto merger in 2018 just made it official for, and public for the masses. And with this connection, we can link Mitt Romney's first major client straight to Nazi Germany, and Mitt Romney himself to Operation Paperclip. So let's pause to consider this for a moment. Mitt Romney had family money. He was a good looking guy. He could have done anything. He could have had any job he wanted. But what did he end up doing? He took over Monsanto at the height of Agent Orange, meaning that Mitt Romney himself was a defense contractor supplying a product he knew to be toxic. And he and his client have lied about it ever since. At its peak production of Agent Orange for the United States government in the 1970s, Monsanto was such an attractive client, Romney and his colleagues from Boston Consulting took the Monsanto account and began their own consulting firm, now known as Bain & Company, one of the big three elite management consulting firms who has been notoriously secretive about itself and its work for its clients, earning Bain & Company the title of the KGB of consulting over the years. From the very beginning, Monsanto, a company who has historically and exclusively dealt in toxic products, made Bain & Company a ton of money. Monsanto, who produced deadly chemicals that they knowingly sprayed over a bunch of people, made Mitt Romney a ton of money. In 2001, Monsanto and DuPont bought a biotech company that had created a gene that made the male sperm sterile. And the crop was called contraceptive corn, saying that fields of maize may one day save the world from overpopulation. So let me just ask, if the genocidal maniacs at Monsanto weren't going to tell you that the chemicals they were spraying on you would cause an array of cancers and birth defects, what are the chances they would tell you if something you're eating would make you sterile? Romney quickly rose up the ranks at Bain, becoming one of the company's vice presidents by the late 1970s, and eventually heading Bain's venture capital arm called Bain Capital in 1984. Though not the first of Romney's outside investors, British publisher Robert Maxwell was among one of the early investors in Romney's Bain Capital. You might have heard me talk about Robert Maxwell before, since he's the father of Ghislaine Maxwell, who's been accused of running a sex trafficking blackmail operation alongside Jeffrey Epstein, a blackmail ring that is allegedly tied to Mossad. Robert Maxwell himself also has ties to Mossad and at the time of his death was accused of being a double or even triple agent for Britain, Israel, and Russia. It's unlikely that Ghislaine knew Epstein at the time of her father's investment to Romney's project, but I'm illustrating the point that these dark connections run deep, and we can trace them across decades. Our deep state is one tiny little group. Speaking of Epstein and blackmail operations with minors, Epstein's buddy, Bill Gates, co-founder of Microsoft and one of the publicly richest people in the world, is looped into this sordid web of connections with Mitt Romney. While Bain functions as a private equity firm, I think we can quite confidently say that Bain Company is a US intelligence front and military industrial company. Since some of the most famous people out of Bain are high level government officials. One of them being former Vice President Dick Cheney, who was in the White House during Vietnam, serving under Presidents Nixon and Ford, earning the position of the Secretary of Defense under the George H.W. Bush administration, only to leave the White House to become one of Bain's most lucrative accounts as the CEO of Halliburton, a government contractor. So not only did Mitt Romney and Dick Cheney both spray Agent Orange, which the government and Monsanto both knew to be toxic from the get-go, but they were also Iraq war profiteers to the tune of $40 billion. Bain's most famous clients were and are Dick Cheney's Halliburton, Raytheon, Monsanto, Microsoft, Starbucks, and even the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Bain manages a great portion of the Fortune 500 companies. That's why their stocks do so well. And while Bain says they're a consulting firm, their pattern is more of a buyout firm that comes in, takes over, and quietly leaves the shell intact while they place their own people in positions of power within a company. So when you walk into any government building or school and witness people working on computers with Microsoft installed on them, that's Bain and company. When you see Bill Gates interviewed on the six o'clock news labeled as a pandemic expert or talking about mandatory vaccinations and grinning with glee, that's Bain and company. 
When he see Mitt Romney, a man who was supposed to be president and is now a sitting senator, marching with people who have expressly stated their desire to burn down our cities, that's Bain and Company. Mitt Romney attended law school so he could enter politics. And while it's highly debated when Romney officially left Bain and Company to make the short leap from business to politics, Romney followed in his father's footsteps, becoming the governor of Massachusetts in the early 2000s. In 2012, he decided to run against Barack Obama for the president of the United States. And quite frankly, Romney should have been a shoe in After all, he was groomed for this role, but the fact was he lost. And so he continued his political career as a senator, a position he holds to this day. His squeaky clean, wholesome Mormon reputation was one of the qualities that made him attractive to so many conservative voters. But does this reputation hold true when Romney was one of the original members of Bain & Company? The only guy who founded Bain Capital, and Bain Capital is the only company that manages Ryan Seacrest. And Ryan Seacrest is the manager of the Kardashians, the pop culture powerhouse of a family and TV show that spanned 18 seasons introducing new societal norms and debates into the American conversation, particularly through Caitlyn Jenner, born Bruce Jenner, Olympic gold medalist, father to six children, and star of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, making Caitlyn Jenner the most famous transgender woman in the whole world. Not only is Mitt Romney responsible for the rise of the Kardashians, but he's responsible for the rise of companies who manufacture the hormones, chemicals, and pills to make little boys transition to little girls and little girls transition to little boys before they ever hit puberty. If Mitt Romney was openly running as the Mystery Babylon pagan Republican candidate, then okay, we've got something going here, seems on par with the religious ideology. And the discussion really ends there, but no, he continues to parade around as a conservative Mormon, which is a smidge misleading to say the least. My point is Mitt Romney is totally inseparable from his past, as he's given rise to some of the most powerful corporations that have forever changed the cultural and political landscape of not just the United States, but the world. Isn't that crazy to say out loud that corporations have forever changed the cultural and political landscape of the world and a corporation serves the purpose of putting a degree of separation between the company's actions and the individuals calling the shots? So what I'm really saying here is that the 1%, the deep state, the owners, the human farmers, whatever you wanna call them, are using corporations and even philanthropic organizations to disguise their agenda and avoid personal liability. And as we've demonstrated with Bain & Company, the government has been on board and aided in this endeavor. So much for free market capitalism, right? It gets a little darker when we ask, what do these companies, these companies that Mitt Romney boosted, what do they actually do? These private companies that are part of the government, just like Mitt Romney was a private businessman, but was somehow directly related to every single defense company in America. It makes you wonder, does it really matter who we elect into power if corporations are controlling our country? Despite the Monsanto Bayer merger, Monsanto has not been able to escape the consequences of its crimes against humanity. So many individuals have gotten cancer as a result of being exposed to Monsanto Roundup, which is basically just Agent Orange repackaged, as Roundup is just another Monsanto herbicide that's killing people. The class action lawsuits are stacking up alongside the bodies. Wouldn't it be amazing to see those responsible for so much death get hauled away by police to a swift trial and an even swifter display of public justice? While well, you can call me a bootlicker all you want, I understand the justice system is far from perfect, but it's even more flawed and ineffective when those who commit crimes against humanity use a corporate front to donate to organizations that explicitly state their goal of defunding the police. Rendering the power of arrest null and void. All you gotta do is follow the money and Mitt Romney's Bain companies that became huge corporations are the ones that now donate to BLM. And where exactly does that money go? Does it go to enriching the lives of African-American families? Of course not. It goes to a specific political party. And Mitt Romney endorsed it. He marched for it under the guise of social justice. But if he really cared about black lives, why did he give rise to companies that poison the groundwater, air, and blood of black cities? Why did he give rise to an organization that specifically carries out vaccine trials in black countries? I'll tell you why. Chaos is the secret weapon the deep state believes will save them. This is the gameplay of the Rockefeller Rothschild system from 100 years ago. 
to destabilize a nation, to divide and conquer the people as a means of distraction, to release dangerous convicts while imprisoning people who don't adhere to the new normal, to push society into total collapse so the 1% can assume control for the foreseeable future. All the while, providing citizens with pills to subdue them into complacency. There's this palpable feeling that hell is about to break loose. All I'm proposing is that we attack the heart of the system, and while the system isn't limited to the companies and individuals I've spoken about in this video, I've exposed the weakest link. Bane is the elephant in the room, and the frontman, Mitt Romney, is their Achilles heel. Hey internet friends, 2021, New Year, same revenge of the nerds plot. Mr. Microsoft, the fourth publicly richest person in the world, and great-grandson of the Federal Reserve Empire, Bill Gates, has embarked on a new endeavor, procuring farmland across the United States to the tune of 224,000 acres that spans across 18 states, earning him the spot as one of the top feudal lords. His largest land holdings reside in Louisiana, Arkansas, Nebraska, Arizona, and Washington. So Gates has gone from computer nerd to generous philanthropist making it rain vaccines down in Africa, the top doctor without a medical degree, to number one go-to guy and public health expert on all things coronavirus and lockdowns. And now he's playing a game of Monopoly with farmland. Gates has been dabbling in agriculture since the early 2000s under the banner of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. As we've covered in previous videos, the Gates Foundation bought up tons of shares of the chemical-turned agricultural company called Monsanto back in the early days of the Gates Foundation. Monsanto is best known for Agent Orange, Roundup, and other chemicals that have caused widespread death and suffering throughout the ages. But now, for some reason, because we live in the upside-down world, they have control over the world's food supply, and they genetically modify our crops with the stated purpose of producing higher yields which means higher profit, more control, and substantially less small farmers, because they simply can't keep up with Monsanto's Franken-crop magic. According to the article I was reading about Farmer Gates, his land is, quote, held directly and through third-party entities by Cascade Investments, Gates's personal investment vehicle. In 2008, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation announced $306 million in grants to promote high-yield, sustainable agriculture among smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. The foundation has further invested in the development and proliferation of super crops resistant to climate change and higher-yield dairy cows. Last year, the organization announced Gates Ag One, a nonprofit to advance those efforts, end quote. Over the last year, I've covered Bill Gates' involvement with the coronavirus and vaccine development as well as his former statements advocating population control. We've discussed his extracurricular activities like creating his own breast milk formula, which I dubbed Bill Gates' titty milk, his endeavor to genetically modify millions and millions of mosquitoes and release them into the wild, and his financial interest in meat alternatives to, fl to fight climate change. He did all of this and didn't receive an ounce of criticism from mainstream media outlets because we also revealed that these media outlets had received funds from the Gates Foundation. And while Bill Gates makes a perfectly good supervillain, I've also demonstrated that he's just a frontman, certainly not alone in his endeavors, but rather the face of what we've come to know as the Gates Empire. So we've got a guy who has a backdoor to every government computer through his software, a firm grip on the media coverage of his shenanigans, and a say in the health not only of this country, but of the world. And now he has control of America's breadbasket. With this new development, we must ask the question that the mainstream media won't. What exactly is the Gates Foundation using their farmland for? We can make a few guesses based on the data we've already collected about Bill Gates. Guess number one. Given that Bill Gates is so heavily invested in meat alternatives, perhaps he aims to drastically raise the cost of natural beef so he can push the soy alternative, pushing lab-grown burgers to the forefront as the most affordable option for everyone. But like this tweet said, if you're planning to block out the sun, you don't buy that farmland to grow food. As of three weeks ago, Bill Gates is still on board in funding the effort to block out the sun by, quote, using a balloon to send reflective particles into the atmosphere with the hope that these would block direct sunlight to the earth and lower the effects of global warming, end quote. Guess number two, neo-feudalism. In addition to extensive land ownership being a lucrative decision for his relationship with Monsanto, 
Buying farmland at this rate makes it difficult for farmers or homesteaders who are just beginning their lives and businesses to get a start. Instead, they'll have to farm on rented land from Bill Gates. This is nothing new. This is a business model we've seen throughout history. Guess number three. This goes along with the information we have about Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030. The less available farmland there is out in the country, the higher the likelihood that people are pushed towards the major city centers, aka mega cities and smart cities, where universal basic income is implemented alongside the trend of jobs being replaced by robots and artificial intelligence. This mix creates a scenario in which the human cattle are completely dependent on the government for money and food. And since all the folks are in one place in these smart cities, they're easily monitored too. The technocrats of the Great Reset we keep hearing about tell us that in the future, there is no private property. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Except the controllers, of course. They'll own everything, just like Farmer Bill. Guess number four, the inoculation angle. Did you know that plants can be used as biofactories for producing antigens and vaccines on a large scale? Essentially, you can use plants to vaccinate the population. The idea is, instead of getting a shot, which is an intentional decision to get inoculated, instead you could just eat a tomato or a piece of fruit and be vaccinated, directly getting that immunity in the form of edible vaccines. You really wouldn't even know it if you were immunized, because there's no prick of the needle. Scientists have been working on edible vaccines for decades, but allegedly it hasn't been rolled out to the public yet. With the advent of COVID-19 and the race to immunize the entire population, whether they like it or not, the idea of edible vaccines is being toyed with. And the theory here is, given Bill Gates' philanthropic and financial interest in vaccinating the population, this land may be used to produce and harvest edible vaccines. Problem, reaction, solution. While Bill Gates' reasons for buying up this farmland have not been disclosed yet, should a man who advocates for population control while vaccinating brown and black children across Asia and Africa, a seemingly sole individual in the public eye who advocates population control so fiercely, should he have control over such a huge share of farmland? It's the same way these tech companies have monopolized the online sphere and therefore the control and flow of information. That's what it appears Bill, our new plantation owner, is doing with America's breadbasket. Did you know that a recent study was released stating that Roundup, Monsanto Roundup, the can cancer-causing weed killer, was found in 80% of people's urine in the United States, according to a study. So here's how they did it. They collected urine samples from people ages 6 and older. And among those people, 80% of those urine samples contained Monsanto Roundup, the cancer-causing herbicide. Hey internet friends, a few videos ago I told you I was done talking about our state actor, Bill Gates. Since then, however, the media has totally turned on him after the announcement of his divorce from Melinda. A lot of you are asking me why. Why the 180 all of a sudden? So in this video, I'm going to tell you my theory on why the media has suddenly turned on Bill. In early May, after 27 years of marriage and decades of testing out snake oil in third world countries together, Bill and Melinda announced that they were divorcing. Their net worth is around $124 billion, so presumably that's getting split up. And the future of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is uncertain. But if money is power, then this couple is one of the most publicly powerful couples in existence today. In 1994, Bill married Melinda French, a marketing manager at Microsoft and daughter of an aerospace engineer from Dallas, Texas. And together, they've had three children. The whole story of their wealth is centered around Microsoft and its success. But the couple's focus across the last few decades has been pharmaceuticals and medicine. In an endeavor they've branded as philanthropy, as Bill Gates and his foundation is, in my opinion, really just the continuation of Rockefeller medicine. There are many layers to this modern-day Devil Bill scandal, so let me lay it out for you. The Wall Street Journal reported on May 9th that, quote, Melinda Gates has been meeting with lawyers since 2019 as she's planned for the divorce. The paper reported on earlier revelations that Bill Gates had spent time with Jeffrey Epstein. Apparently, Melinda Gates had worried about Epstein's relationship with Bill. 
The New York Times reported in October of 2019 that Bill had met with Epstein many times since 2011, though Bill Gates has denied any business relationship or friendship with Epstein. By the way, anytime I post this picture on social media, I immediately get fact checkers all over it within like five seconds. But the story behind this picture is that it was taken at Jeffrey Epstein's mansion in Manhattan and pictured from left to right. James Staley, who was at the time a senior J.P. Morgan executive, former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers, who's also a Genie Energy advisor. If you remember, New Jersey-based Genie Energy is digging for oil in Syria right now, even though it clearly violates international law under the Geneva Convention. Other Genie Energy members include Dick Cheney, Rupert Murdoch, Lord Jacob Rothschild, and ex-CIA director James Woolsey. Genie Energy is a huge U.S. government conflict of interest. But I digress. Okay, next in the picture, we have Jeffrey Epstein, then Bill Gates, and Boris Nikolic, who, who was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation science advisor. To summarize what I've just said here, the news is trying to make it seem like the Epstein connections going public were the last straw for Melinda. And she wanted a divorce with the implication that she's taking the moral high ground and is alarmed by Bill's connections. Furthermore, stories were leaked about Bill Gates' affair that happened nearly 20 years ago, making him look like an all-around sleazeball because he's a womanizer and went to Epstein Island and whatever happened there probably involved underage girls, procured by Ghislaine Maxwell, whose trial is set for November. In my opinion, it's the same PR move they pulled with nursing home grandma killer and New York Governor Andrew Cuomo when the stories about nursing home death tolls were released. Instead of the media focusing on those numbers, the media ran a story on allegations of Cuomo making sexual marks on a staffer's looks, as well as other inappropriate questions and comments. So that story really overshadowed the nursing home story. Even though, can we just say, killing a bunch of old people and keeping them from their families, making them die alone, hiding the numbers, I feel like that's objectively way worse than, you know, commenting on somebody's looks at work, or making sexual remarks to somebody at work. Neither are good. Neither are good behavior, but one is way worse than the other. Anyway, I think that's what they're doing here, floating one story to redirect attention elsewhere. Let me explain the first layer of my very simple theory. Just like with Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos' divorce last year, Bill and Melinda allegedly had no prenup. So as part of their divorce, tons of stocks are liquidated, reportedly divided between spouses. These are some of the publicly richest people in the world moving around tons of money during a very precarious time. If they publicly did so without the pretext of divorce, then the whole world would follow suit. Monkey see, monkey do style with the billionaires and their money moves. Billionaire is really a divisive word on this channel because that amount of money is just a number on a screen. It's just a push of a button, but these digital dollars, this fake cash, whatever you want to call it, you can make the argument that it buys up real assets. And right now, there are so many rumors of economic collapse and hyperinflation. It would be the perfect time to go liquidate all your stock and go be degenerate in your multi-million dollar bunker while the rest of us go get our wheelbarrows full of petrodollars and go buy our loaves of bread. I just don't really buy the moral high road that Melinda is taking here with the Epstein associations, or that she was burned by his affair. Because in a 1997 Time magazine profile three years after he married Melinda, Bill explained that he spent a long weekend every year with his old girlfriend, Ann Winblad. Now ladies, comment below if you'd be okay with your husband spending a long weekend away every year with his ex-girlfriend. Yeah, I just don't buy the moral high ground either when you run an organization that does experimental medicine on third world countries. Like, I just don't buy anything the news is saying. And going around right now is all this hopium that Jizz Lane is going to spill the beans about Bill Gates and his antics with Epstein and that's why the media has turned on Bill and yada yada yada. I don't do hopium either. I don't do hopium on this channel unless it's warranted, and most likely it's not in this scenario. I've already shown you on this channel how the Gates Foundation has a backdoor deal with several media companies in the form of grants, and that's why Bill's been the media darling for so long. The benevolent philanthropist. And I guarantee you any stories they're pumping out right now about him, 
those are being pumped out for a reason and by his own managing company's direction. It's all a distraction, in my opinion, because the real story is this. Bill Gates comes from a banking family, a Federal Reserve banking family, as his great-granddad was the head of the Federal Reserve. So his family was way richer than you or me could ever imagine way before he even muttered the word Microsoft. At the same time Microsoft was getting off the ground, they were being managed by Mitt Romney and associates at Bain & Company, where they took Microsoft as a shell company and staffed it with Bain people, setting Bill up for even more success as the front man for the company. While they were doing this, Ghislaine Maxwell's father, Robert Maxwell, a British publishing baron, was pumping money in the form of investments into Bain Capital, which was ran by Mitt Romney at the time. If you haven't seen my video on Ghislaine and her family, I'll spoil it for you. Major spoilers ahead. Robert Maxwell was a not-so-kosher spy. His loyalties were allegedly between Great Britain, Israel, and Russia, as he was suspected as a triple or double agent. Fast forward, his daughter is hanging out with Epstein over at a little island, allegedly blackmailing politicians and prominent figures. So the whole spy thing really seems generational. And the consensus seems to be that Mossad was controlling the whole operation of luring in these figureheads to this island, tempting them with unspeakable things and blackmailing them. The only question is, blackmailing them to do what? So Bain, which was financed by an Israeli spy, staffed Microsoft with Bain people announced Bill Gates as their front man, and now Microsoft operating systems are on every government computer in our country, which allows them backdoor access to whatever secrets our nation holds. And then the little cherry on the top is that there was an island where blackmail was taking place by the same organization. And Bill Gates hung out with his buddy Epstein, all while Bain Company managed the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, testing out snake oil on third world countries. All while Bill ran around to TED Talks like he did in 2015, warning of a coronavirus-like threat that was the next big threat to humanity and predicted to the audience that he would be the savior of this future pandemic. Then in 2018, Bill ran a pandemic virus simulation which he projected would kill 33 million people if the simulation came to fruition. Then in October of 2019, the Gates Foundation hosted Event 201 at the World Economic Forum in New York which was a high-level pandemic exercise that played out a novel coronavirus pandemic with potentially catastrophic consequences. At the exact same time Event 201 was happening, the 2019 Military World Games were taking place, hosting 110 nations and thousands of military members from around the world in none other than Ground Zero, Wuhan, China. Of course, all of this took place before any news media announced anything about a virus. Then, on February 28, 2020, Bill Gates called corona a once-in-a-century pathogen we've all been worried about, and he sounded the alarm for world leaders to respond accordingly. A few weeks later, Bill Gates stepped down from the Microsoft Board of Directors, and then he began funneling cash into creating a solution to this problem in the form of a pharmaceutical injection. And now, May 2021, he's seen his efforts just blossom because people carry around little cards saying they've been injected with one of the injections he's funded. And they expect these little cards to grant them freedoms to return to normal. That's the real story. Do I think Bill Gates is a womanizer and Melinda is a woman scorned who finally had enough? Absolutely not. Not for a second. Am I supposed to care that the guy who was injecting the world with experimental snake oil, buying up the farmland, investing in Monsanto, a Bain company who controls the world's food supply, releasing GMO mosquitoes, hanging out at Epstein Island? Am I supposed to care that he was unfaithful in his marriage? Is that really his greatest sin here? The deflection and distraction is just off the charts. Bill and Melinda, they're all state actors. Actors, I mean it, most likely they're just moving money around. And that's my theory. But I want to hear yours, internet friends. Let me know. You know, I always look forward to reading your comments. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing, and supporting my channel on Patreon. Bye. Hey, internet friends. As if social media companies weren't already oppressively censoring the internet, Bill Gates' Microsoft has decided to form their own Ministry of Truth. Only this ministry is more of an all-seeing-eye type of operation.
Along with Adobe, Arm, the British Broadcasting Corporation, Intel, and TruePic, Microsoft is putting together a coalition to quote, develop end-to-end -end open standard for tracing the origin and evolution of digital content, end quote. In other words, they're developing a process to trace the origin of what they have dubbed over the last few years, fake news. Since the 2016 election, disinformation and fake news have been the reason that social media and internet monopolies like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Google have justified censoring the flow of information. Do you remember the guy who allegedly came in and shot a round off in Comet Ping Pong in Washington, D.C.? That was a prominent example of the dangers of fake news that legacy media utilized to manufacture consent of this censorship. But I digress. Microsoft put out this press release on February 22nd. Basically, we already have social media companies doing the most they can to silence what they call disinformation. But Microsoft and company is bringing the technology to the battle. With the title of this press release reading, Technology and media entities join forces to create standards group aimed at building trust in online content. They say they've identified, quote, a critical need to address widespread deception in online content. So they've put together a joint development foundation project established to address the prevalence of disinformation. And they're gonna develop some technology and standards for certifying the source and history of this fake news. Essentially, since it's so easy for people to spread dangerous fake news through the internet, through a series of tweets or even a YouTube video, you know, real harmful stuff, they're working to be able to identify the origin of it. Though, curiously, in their press release, it doesn't say what the punishment will be for being identified as the origin of whatever they dub as misinformation. The goal of this coalition is to distribute this technology they're developing to online platforms across the net so that fake news can be stopped in its tracks. These next blurbs are from Reclaim the Net, who did a fantastic job of covering this development soon after it emerged. Former Microsoft CEO Bill Gates has been a big supporter of modern moves to censor more on social media. During an interview at the Wall Street Journal Summit in London, Gates complained that the suggestions for suppressing conspiracy theories and misinformation on big tech, tech platforms are less creative than we need at this point and called for smart solutions. When asked about the role of tech platforms when it comes to dealing with misinformation, Gates lamented what he described as a human weakness for titillating things, such as claims that the coronavirus is man-made or that there's some conspiracy around it. Gates added that social media platforms allow this type of content to spread very quickly. Of course, on this channel, I've repeated maybe a dozen times who exactly Bill Gates is, but maybe you'll find value in me repeating it again. If you watch my previous videos on Bill Gates, we've established that Bill comes from a very affluent family, as he's the great-grandson of the Seattle Federal Reserve on his mother's side. And his father, in addition to a career as a high-profile attorney with offices around the world, was on the board of Planned Parenthood. While most people associate Bill Gates with Microsoft, he's expanded his influence from technology to medicine, to the food supply, to government surveillance. And finally, we've demonstrated that while Bill Gates is a billionaire with the big bucks, he's also just a figurehead leading the technocracy charge into the future. And behind his power and influence from the very start has been the Bain Company, one of the big three management firms that has staffed, directed, and guided his initiatives beginning with Microsoft. And now they work directly with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So while Bill Gates is a perfect boogeyman, he's an even better frontman for a larger cabal at work. Some of his recent projects include attempts to block out the sun to fight climate change, releasing millions of GMO mosquitoes into Florida with the stated intention of eradicating mosquito-borne illnesses, financially backing a new infant formula we lovingly call Bill Gates Titty Milk. He's also making the push for everyone to eat lab-grown beef, alongside vaccine development, distribution, and testing those vaccines on the third world. And he does all this while financing news networks that report on his activity. And he drinks poop water. I don't, I didn't really know how to fit that in there, but poop water, he drinks poop water. And back in 2018, Bill Gates, who by the way is not a medical professional, nor is he an elected leader, ran a pandemic virus simulation, which he projected would kill 33 million people if, if that simulation came to fruition. 
A year later, alongside the Johns Hopkins Center for Healthy Security, the Gates Foundation hosted Event 201 at the World Economic Forum in October of 2019. Event 201 was a high-level pandemic exercise that basically played out a pandemic with potentially catastrophic consequences, which then became what the Gates Foundation labeled Event 201 that would require cooperation between industries, governments, and key institutions. And on February 28, 2020, exactly a year ago from when I'm filming this, Bill Gates called the coronavirus the once-in-a-century pathogen we've all been worried about, as he sounded the alarm for world leaders to respond accordingly. Then COVID and lockdowns happened, small businesses went belly up, we're all being pressured to take a vaccine we don't want, and many of those vaccines were developed by companies that Bill Gates financed. People hate Bill Gates. No wonder he wants to censor the internet. In summary, Microsoft's coalition is probably just another attempt to censor information, not disinformation. It's opposition management. By the way, who monitors Microsoft and these other companies? Who makes sure that they're being held to any moral or ethical standards? Hey internet friends, a couple years ago after doing a few videos on Bill Gates and the people behind his brand, I vowed to never make another video on him again. Well, listen, we had a good run. Uh, anyway, Bill Gates hosted a Reddit AMA on Wednesday. Reddit is notoriously controlled and manipulated in the favor of liberal pro-science lefty discourse, just so you know. So this place is a safe haven for Bill to do a question and answer session versus somewhere else like Twitter. Because as you can see, Bill has his replies turned off on Twitter, so you can't ask him your most pressing questions. I'm going to read some highlights from his AMA session so you don't have to. We're just gonna hop right in. The top comment with almost 10,000 upvotes reads, why are you buying up so much farmland? Do you think this is a problem with billionaire wealth and how much you can disproportionately acquire? I love to see this question. This is a very valid question. Bill, who is in cahoots with Monsanto, a poison company who controls the lion's share of the world's food supply, has been buying up United States farmland for the past few years, and everyone has been wondering, why is he doing that? It seems somewhat sinister. He doesn't seem like the best guy to have the uh, so much farmland in control of the food supply. It just doesn't seem like a good idea. So Bill's answer to this very important question was this, quote, I own less than one four thousandth of the farmland in the U.S. I have invested in these farms to make them more productive and create more jobs. There isn't some grand scheme involved. In fact, all these decisions are made by a professional investment team. In terms of the very rich, I think they should pay a lot more in taxes and they should give away their wealth over time. It has been very fulfilling for me and is my full-time job. End quote. Bill, no one can accuse you of not having a sense of humor. I too own less than one four thousandth of the farmland in the United States. I love the wording of the answer, you little rat. Your PR firm has their work cut out for them, don't they? Back in 2020, I told you that Bill was procuring farmland across the United States to the tune of 224,000 acres at that time that spanned across 18 states, earning him the spot as one of the top feudal lords of the states. His largest land holdings reside in Louisiana, Arkansas, Nebraska, Arizona, and Washington. And let me tell you, fact checkers had a field day marking that as misinformation from their mom's basement. One of my videos on Bill Gates, I think that one on the farmland, got removed from YouTube without a warning, like without an email to me whatsoever. Anyway, someone commented underneath his answer saying, well, Bill, that seems like an insane amount of farmland <laughs> comparable to the area of entire nations. But then what's curious, if you keep scrolling... Somehow any critique of Bill's answer or question, follow-up questions was downvoted to oblivion so you can't even see it. Moving on, the next question for Bill, why are you so focused on healthcare and vaccines? To which Bill replied, quote, when I saw that kids were dying who could be saved for less than $1,000 per life, I knew that had to be at the top of my priority list for giving back. There was almost no one funding work on diseases like malaria, which was killing over a million kids a year then. We have made progress, but it's still around 400,000 deaths a year due to malaria, and we are committed to getting it to zero eventually, end quote. There's only a few responses to his answer, which I find quite curious, given that it's been established by now that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, managed by Bain and Company, is the continuation of Rockefeller Medicine, which was headed by Devil Bill back then, the snake oil salesman, who sired oil magnets like John D., 
eugenicist. Bill Bill Gates' father sat on the board of eugenicist Margaret Sanger's Planned Parenthood, and he sat on that board before the era of Roe versus Wade. But the fact of the matter is that the Gates Foundation goes into these third world countries with their life-saving snake oil, and they inoculate populations without their informed consent. They're treating communities who don't really have a say, and then they use them like guinea pigs to test the efficacy of their snake oil and document the adverse reactions. But if there are adverse reactions, it's not like there's a system of checks and balances in these third world countries to hold Bill accountable. So that's why you saw, if you have a good memory, stories coming out of India saying that Bill's experiments had left a significant number of individuals with adverse reactions. But those articles have since been scrubbed from the internet and fact checkers swoop in to correct the record. Mainly on that cute little quote that Bill gave about if we can make some really good vaccines, we can reduce the population by 10%. Fact checkers are like, no, he didn't say that. No, that's not what he meant. Okay, hun, whatever. Bell goes on to answer questions about climate change, AI, taxation of the wealthy, and his favorite rock band. All underhand, slow-pitch softball questions, but he ignored questions like his ties to Jeffrey Epstein. Keep in mind that Epstein was convicted in 2008 for child prostitution, but all these big-name celebrities and politicians kept meeting and hanging out with them. Specifically, Bill Gates, who had documented meetings with him around 2010, saying that the meetings were to raise money for the Gates Foundation. Whatever you say, Bill. In September 2021, Bill Gates squirmed and played with his ring finger when PBS NewsHour Judy Woodruff grilled him about his dealings with Epstein. Woodruff asked Gates about having had a number of meetings with Epstein after the latter had already been found guilty of soliciting prostitution from minors. And all he really said back was that he had dinners with Epstein, but he regretted it now. Yeah, I bet you do. So in summary, you can ask Bill anything during these AMA sessions, but don't go expecting an answer. And if you do get one, it's likely from a group of highly paid PR professionals who did a line right before sitting down at the keyboard. That's all, Internet friends. You can go read the rest of Bill's answers yourself should you desire to do so. I'm leaving the link in the description of this video. And as always, I look forward to your comments. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing, and supporting my channel on Patreon. Bye.